everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of Better Know a Birder. I'm Dan Scheinman, Bird Conservation Director for Audubon, Arkansas. I'm glad you're all here with us today, and I'm delighted to introduce our guest birder, Sandy the Bird Lady Burger, who has always had a fascination with anything outdoorsy while growing up, but when her mother gifted her with a Peterson's Field Guide, and binoculars, that's when her specific love of birds started. Uh, when she and her husband moved from Edmond, Oklahoma to Fort Smith, where she is now, she joined the Dogwood Trails Audubon Society and her real bird addiction kicked in. Sandy eventually became an officer of that club, then president of Arkansas Audubon Society. And while being a substitute teacher over the last 20 years, She's also led field trips, run breeding bird survey routes, helped with banding, surveyed shorebirds and cerulean warblers, and taught at UA Fort Smith. And she cites our fellow birders, Bill Bell and Karen McGee as her mentors. So Sandy, it's a pleasure to be talking with you this morning. Um, I, like so many of us, you've been home for a long time because of coronavirus. <laughs> Have you, uh, you've been watching your backyard birds a lot. Have you seen any good yard birds? Added any new yard birds? Um, I haven't added any for such a tiny little yard in the middle of Fort Smith. I, um, I have an abundance of birds. I don't know what brings them into me. It's like there's a neon sign on my roof saying, come to my house. But, um, you know, I've got my Inca doves that come. Um, white winged doves now come. And um, I don't know, I just get a good mix with my mulberry trees and uh, such. So nothing new. The same old guys, but <laughs> I love them. I love having them. Well, those doves are such a treat there, you know, because they're not widespread across Arkansas, but they are right. getting their range gradually. So I know right. a good breeding population of white-winged doves in Fort Smith now. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's good having them. And um, the, the Incas are the best because <laughs> really people don't have those. And so to have them in my neighborhood for many, many years, that was awesome. I'm yeah. kind of proud. I'm kind of proud. <laughs> <laughs> your little inky, your inky doos. <laughs> but Fort Smith is a pretty good birding spot. Uh, you certainly have, I think, shined a light on some of the hot spots birding in Fort Smith. So where's your favorite place to go in the city? Um, you know, um, a few years ago, the city made Sunny Mead Park. It's not been a park here in Fort Smith very long. Um, it has a water retention pond there, so it's it's for, um, I guess, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure. They, they collect water there and then send it off to the treatment plant, but they also put in a walking trail and they also planted wildflowers. So it being right on the river, it has been an incredible, incredible spot to bird. We have 191 species listed on, I don't know, I, I'm not good with acreage, but it's not very big. It's not a very big park at all. So that has turned into my favorite place. But there are a lot of other places. You know, we're not too far from um, Frog Bayou and the Alma, tr uh, treatment, Alma treatment plant. Um, we get great birds over in that area. Um, and Oklahoma's real close too. So yeah. a lot of good stuff in Oklahoma. Well, I think Frog Bayou Wildlife Management Area, like Sunny Mead Park, is another good example of if you build it, they will come. Right. And they came and fish restored habitat there, and now it's become an amazing place for marsh birds and other water birds. And the migrants. The, and the you migrants know, it's a great migrant trap. So. And then perfect. maybe maybe not a lot of people are aware that wastewater treatment plants can be good places to bird. What are some of the specialties of the Alma wastewater treatment plant? Um, let's see, we've had rare species, and it's not just the wastewater treatment plant, but across the road, there's uh, farmland, and for some reason that attracts. So uh, between those two areas, which are right across the road from each other, we've had roseate spoonbill and tricolored heron, um, lease turns, um, you know, in August and early fall, we see juveniles there with the adults. 
Um, oh, I'm going to miss a lot of things. Black belly uh, whistling ducks. Wow, they're all over the place now. Yeah. They're everywhere. Uh, yeah, so um, there's a, a lot of good birds that show up that are migrants. Oh, I got my life uh, swallow-tailed kite just down the hill, you might say, just down the next road in the river bottoms a couple years ago. So, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I, I meant to mention at the beginning, if you have questions for Sandy and you're on Zoom, please post those in the chat box. And if you are on Facebook Live, please post your comments, uh, your questions in the comment box and those will be relayed to me to relay to Sandy. So feel free to ask questions of our fellow birder. So you, uh, you mentioned birding in Oklahoma. You are on the border, so I am right. going to Oklahoma a lot. And I wore my Oklahoma Ornithological Society shirt for the occasion. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so uh, where do you like to go birding in Oklahoma? Where would you like uh, Arkansas birders go in Oklahoma? Okay, um, about 40 miles west of here, maybe not even that much, is Sequoia National Wildlife Refuge. And I know we have Hollow Bend in Arkansas, which is great, but I'm closer to Sequoia. So I go to Sequoia a lot. I have been for many, many years doing volunteer work there, bird banding. Um, it's just a great, great place to go. Um, used to be the Moth at Bottoms, which is five minutes or so from my house, was the place to go uh, for shorebirds. I pretty much have every shorebird in a field guide just over here in Moffitt. It was excellent. But then sadly, the farmers got a hold of it in the last few years and they drained it and flattened it. And uh, we don't get the big rains like we used to. Uh, things have changed that way. And so because we don't get the big flooded fields anymore, the, the shorebirding has diminished greatly. And because shorebirds have diminished, the migrants following them, the hawks and the falcons and such have diminished. So we don't see them. We don't see the uh, egrets and herons like we used to because rainfall amounts have changed and, and the habitats changed. So used to be great, kind of just drive right through on my way to Sequoia now, sadly. Oh, that's but, disappointing. Yeah. Well, the last year was a time of great flood for the greater Fort Smith area including Moffitt Bottoms. Have it, you was, it was too great. Too great, yes. <laughs> too great. But have you seen a recovery of habitat since the flood? Do things, are things back to normal? No, not at all. It's amazing. It's amazing what flattening and draining fields, I, I mean, it quickly went back to just the way it was before, very quickly. If you drove over there now, you would see all the little ruts they've cut into the fields to drain off faster. And um, they even broke through a levee out there that used to contain a lot of the wetlands and they busted through it so that would drain off even faster. So no, you would think with the flooding it would improve it possibly, but it's gone right back to the same way. It's fully recovered to be farmland. I see. Sadly. I keep trying, I keep going over it. We get an inch of rain, I try. <laughs> so you, you mentioned you, uh, you volunteer at Sequoia, you do breeding bird survey routes, except this year when the breeding bird survey has sadly been canceled. Yeah. But, uh, what drives you to volunteer your time for birds? You know, when you got that love for something, it's just the love of something. Uh, everybody's got different hobbies. We've got birds <laughs> and there's just something in you that makes you love them. And so you want to do things for them, I guess. Um, but I don't know, every chance I get to, some of it is, is discovery. It's like, what are you gonna see next? And there's always that possibility when you're out there banding birds and uh, doing breeding bird surveys. And it, the trends are very interesting to me. You know, what has gone away, what has stepped in. You know, I have Western Kingbirds now on my breeding bird survey, which just a couple of years ago I did not have. And you lose things and you gain things. And so I don't know, it's just that um, discovery of what's out there what's going on with the habitat, all those things all together, but it all is to the benefit of birds, you know. 
It's loving birds. Yeah, I appreciate that. You have the time, you have the talent. So yeah. share that in a way that uh, contributes to community science and yeah. helps us with our understanding of bird distribution and changes over time. And, you know, I don't get paid for it. It's, it's volunteer work. Everything, uh, there's been two times I've been paid and it was great. But, you know, it's volunteer work, but it's needed. It's important. It's very important. Uh, someone asks, what resource would you should, sorry, what resource would you suggest to help in identifying birds? Oh, uh, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have a couple of books here. <laughs> Can we see my books? Yeah. I see my books. One of my oldest friends right here, my two field guides, Nat Geo's and Sibley's. Those two I recommend all the time. Um, I understand people don't care. I, hate, I don't want to be mean, but people don't seem to care about doing research a lot anymore and finding the answer for themselves. So we have things like Merlin that I have started suggesting a little bit more right. to people because it's a free app and it, it might help them if they don't want to do the research. At least it might help them find their way somewhere. But overall, my field guides are what I recommend. What you got? Oh, there's Merlin. I got Merlin up. Yep. Merlin, the app from Cornell. Yep. Helping it's you okay. Birds. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You can't always take the first answer for granted. You got to do a little bit of research, as you said, make sure the range maps and the field marks all match up before you just accept right. what Merlin says. Right. Um, so, you know, for identification purposes, and then also, I always recommend to new people, if you can find a group to go birding with, you know, sadly in Fort Smith, we don't have that anymore, but if you could find a group to go birding with and ask questions and pay attention, you're gonna learn a lot. That's how I learned. That's the main way I learned, so. Me too. Oh, by the way, do you happen to still have your first Peterson's guide that your mother gave you? Oh, you know, no, I don't. It's a sad story. <laughs> you want oh. me to tell my story? Do you want to, if you want to share it, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Okay. So, um, a few, about 10 years ago, I was doing a program out at the River Valley Nature Center here in Fort Smith. And I took all my field guides with me. And I had a lot of things to give out to people. It was a family thing. And so I was finished. I had stacked up my books to take with me. And I turned to talk to a, a kid. And when I turned back around, somebody had taken all my field guides. Every one of my field guides, all my notes, all my records. I know, I know, it's awful. And that, including my Petersons that my mom had given me. And so I, I lost them. Well, one of, the, one of the worst things I lost was my signed Sibley's guide. I had met him and he signed it for me. We were in Maryland and he signed it for me and it was great. And I had kept all my records. My Oklahoma records were in one book and my Arkansas records were in another. So I honestly am clueless as to my numbers and things like that. But the end of the story, and I, I brought it out here so I could show everyone, the the gal who runs the nature center felt bad. She felt horrible. She tried on the intercom to call people, you know, bring those back kind of thing. She felt really bad. So she on her own contacted David Sibley and told him what happened. Wait for it. <laughs> and said, can you sign another book and send it to us so we can give it to Sandy because of what happened? He said, why don't you do this? Why don't you buy the book? Because it'll be cheaper that way. And I'll autograph a book plate and send it. And then she can put it in the book. Well, not only did he sign me a book plate, and this is gonna be backwards, I guess, on here, but he sent me a book plate that says, To Sandy, Happy Birding, David Sibley, March 2011. And he drew a picture on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I have an original uh, Godwit. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. 
So, it is yeah. amazing. Isn't that uh, awesome? A happy ending to a sad story. <laughs> <laughs> so this did not go in my book. It is in the <laughs> I'm not losing this. <laughs> so yes, I thought that was very, very kind of him. And I have original Sibley artwork. So very nice. whoever got my books, I can have them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sadly, I, I lost all those and they were very important to me. And I hope somebody feels guilty, but yet uses them. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they got some money for a signed Sibley's book on eBay. Maybe. They probably were clueless. But anyway. Anyway, well, for the for the record, I do have my first Peterson guide still. And awesome. It, it has my check marks in it, but it does not go outside. It stays. Yeah. Up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Live and learn, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, besides birding in Arkansas and Oklahoma, where else have you been birding? Ooh. Outside the U.S. Outside the U.S. Okay, I've pretty much got a lot covered from Maine to to here, and some out west. Um, but out of country, I the only official bird trip, I birding trip I took was with Dr. Cannon to Trinidad and Tobago. That's my official one. But I've been to Guyana, South America, six times on mission trips. But then again, I really didn't get a chance to bird watch. But you know, I, was, I took my binoculars and uh, was fascinated and wrote notes and tried to figure some things out. So that was cool. But on our way back from Guyana, we, uh, our leader always saw to it that we had a day off. And so we would hit an island for 24 hours. So I've been to Grenada a couple of times and the Bahamas one time. And where else? Oh, and Trinidad and Tobago before my trip with Cannon. So I had six different one day trips to different islands. And so that was fantastic. And what I would do is before I left the United States, I would hire guides in those countries. The best were, um, probably the best one was Grenada. Oh my gosh, the, the young man was amazing. He worked for the tourism industry and he took me out all day, one day um, in Grenada bird watching. So I got to see endangered species and nesting species and all kinds of things like that. So that was fantastic. Nice young man. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. If you're, when you're traveling, it definitely pays to be with a local expert. Yeah. We Even stopped. We it. stopped. We, we stopped in a, a roadside bar, which are all over the place because we were hot and, uh, you know, it's very hot down there in June. And uh, they all speak their own lingo, which is English and a mix of other things. And so I can't understand what they're saying. And we walked into this bar and there were all these guys in there shooting <laughs> and stuff. And you could see them look at me and talk to him like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. And I, I'm very thankful I did it. It was lots of fun. So my numbers are not huge, but, um, you know, I've got stuff. I've got stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of these years, I will take that Trinidad and Tobago trip with Dr. Cannon, who's the ornithologist at UA Fort Smith and an expert, right. well-traveled birder. Yeah, he's stuck in Sri Lanka right now. Oh, yeah, I know, right? When, went there for sabbatical and got stuck because of COVID. Yep, he's stuck. Not a bad place to be stuck, I suppose. No, no, it's not. It could be worse places. Yeah. Uh, so, um, oh, again, reminder, everybody, if you have questions for Sandy, you can post that into the chat box or the comment box on Facebook. So, um, oh, someone asks, how do you recommend preparing for a birding trip? Like what research do you do, you do or what books or apps do you recommend for preparing oh. birding? Uh, yeah, you have to do research before you go. If um, there's, all, there's all kinds of field guides now that you can purchase. Probably that's the first thing I would do is to find the field guide that you need for that country. Not all countries have them. Um, what they have are maybe poorly written, not very complete. 
But I can tell you, um, like when I went to the Indies, just Grenada, I bought the East Indies Field Guide because it's may not have everything, but it's got a lot, you know, that kind of thing. So um, there's a lot of audio now that you can get into. Um, Macaulay Library, what's the other one uh, that I can't ever remember the name of? Zeno Canto. Thank you. <laughs> Zeno Canto. With an X. X E yes. N O. Zeno. X E N O. Canto. Yep. Um, there are those things. Um, I don't know. Getting the field guide and, and talking to people who've been there before, kind of thing. But field guide, I guess, would be the big one. Yeah. And just to pour over it, pour over it like you would your American field guides. That's how you learn. You keep looking at the pictures. Now you can be overwhelmed when you go to some countries like South America countries, because they might in their field guide have 50 pages of hummingbirds. <laughs> but, but your leader should know if, if you don't go with a leader, you're going to have to do a lot of research on your own. Yeah. I've done the same thing. I've, um, I make flashcards. Ah. As two overseas trips, I've made flashcards for those. And um, my birding guide on those last two trips, who I'll be interviewing next Friday, Stefan Lorenz, he has to prepare just the same as we have to prepare before he leads a birding trip. Right. So he makes uh, digital flashcards in PowerPoint and the same thing, just takes photos and goes through the photos again and again and again to learn the birds, listen to the recordings of the calls that are available. Right. So just practicing it. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's such a, Kind of a simple thing to do when you've got time on your hands and you can sit and look through a book. I'll never forget, this was in, this was in my uh, Fort Smith group when I was a novice birder, but I had poured through that book enough. I remember going on a field trip to Sequoia Wildlife Refuge and we were scanning um, a pond, a wet area, and people were going, oh, there's a so-and-so and there's a so-and-so and I borrowed one of their um, scopes and was still scanning and all of a sudden I went, oh, 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 there's some of those. And I didn't know what they were called, but I remember seeing them in the book. And so I grabbed a book and I thumbed through it and I found them and it was hooded mergansers. And nobody else had seen them but me continuing to scan with my scope. And so I wouldn't have known, I remember that black and white head, seeing it with the ducks and I found it. And uh, so it's exciting. Do the same thing on your, for your trips. If you're going to Maine or if you're going to South America or India, there's, there's books. You can do the research. Our friend Ann Gordon wants you to tell everybody about the habitat restoration at Ben Garen Golf Course. Oh, okay. I can do that. Um, uh, Jay, who pretty much runs the golf course out there, Jay Randolph is um, converting the golf course, not the whole golf course, not where the guys hit the ball. I don't know golf, but anyway, the um, greens. The, yeah, not the greens. The greens are cut and been like they should be, but the, uh, what's it called? The tall grass and stuff. The rough. The rough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't play so, golf by the way. <laughs> I don't even watch it. Um, so the rough has been all converted back to prairie habitat. He has done an incredible job with all the prairie plants, the prairie flowers. And because he is doing that, and he's still working on it, because he's doing that, oh, he does burns. Um, the birds have come back, the prairie birds have come back, which is really cool. So he uh, gets those things I've uh, bird watched out there for a couple of years, recording what has been seen and heard, put it on eBird so people can go look and see. But um, he's done a great job. He has quail out there. Um, he has a harrier in the winter hunting over the tall grasses, which is so cool. So yeah, it's, it's a neat place to go. I drove out there yesterday and the liatris is thick again this year. And that was never there before until Jay decided this was something to do that was important. And he's worked with all kinds of agencies to get them involved. It, it's marvelous. Yeah, another if you example chance, of, uh, yeah, if you restore it, they will come, right? Uh, absolutely. So he has, yeah, the summer birds and the winter birds are prairie type birds and uh, it's perfect. 
I went to a golf course like that in uh, the central Wisconsin in the sand hills of Wisconsin where uh, colors have shown up again. And that golf course where all the prairie plants are growing around the edges, uh, they've got the rare Carner blue butterfly. Super. Carner blues when I was there. I didn't see any curtains warblers while I was there either, but I at least got to see the work that they were doing on the golf course. Yeah. Better play yeah. With birds and other wildlife. It'd be great if there were more more of this being done. I, I think oh. there is. I think it, I think people are starting to be aware, hopefully more aware of, of the good things they can do with habitat restoration. Yeah, and, and Jay has been a partner for Audubon Arkansas, providing some of the plant seeds for us for Audubon Arkansas's native project, where we're working with farmers to exponentially increase the seed supply for restoration projects. Yeah, it's great. He's something else. Mm -hmm. Have you have you birded with him? You haven't. Have you I met have him? Not. Nope, nope. Just over email. He he's something else. He's so excited about it, and uh, it's marvelous. He works with the top prairie people in the country. And uh, I think it's marvelous. Not saying that I'm one of the top prairie people. <laughs> <laughs> I meant for grasses and plants and things like that. But uh, yeah, I'm glad to know, I'm glad he's here. So I wanna um, move away from birds for a moment and comment on something that I've seen on your Facebook page. And that is you, you have this set of, I think, I describe them as bowling pin shaped rubber chickens <laughs> that you photograph in all sorts of situations in the prairies, in a tree, in a creek, in the snow, at Bass Pro Shop, with sand. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like flat, uh, what's that? Um, that uh, flat Stanley. Flat Stanley thing, <laughs> yeah. So what, what's up with that? And do you get funny looks from people when you're carrying your flock of rubber chickens around? It's the best. You talk, <laughs> it's so fun. You know, I like making people laugh. I can't help it. It's just fun. I enjoy it. So my oldest son, who's now 33, 34, something like that. Um, well, for years before, we had little rubber chickens we would use as game pieces and such like that. There's a store in Memphis, Tennessee that sells them. And it just started. Well, a couple of years ago, I got this box for Christmas and a package was, there was a couple of rubber chickens laying in. I laughed so hard and he made me sit on one of the packages that came in the box and they all went, you know, like a whole bunch of rubber chickens would do. Wah! Yeah. <laughs> and so he gave these rubber chickens to me just as a joke for a Christmas present. Well, I couldn't just leave them sitting in the closet in a box. When you have something that awesome, you have to use them. <laughs> so we started this thing of just doing rubber chickens, dressing them up for parties. I took the whole box of them to Maine a couple of summers ago, and we you can make bikinis for them out of balloons. There's just endless things you can do with rubber chickens. <laughs> but the, it makes people laugh. It just... That's it. And uh, so I have to get creative some, but it, even my husband's in on it now. He's like, we got to take those with us camping. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much and they're just funny. Instagram actually has quite a few uh, rubber chicken sites. Yeah. Thing for everybody out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's all it comes down to. And, um, you know, they, I don't know. It's just making people laugh. All right. Well, I appreciate it's, that. It's a lot of hard work, believe it or not. It's, a, it's hard work dressing them up in costumes. <laughs> <laughs> Making the costumes. Also. <laughs> I went to, um, um, not Michael's, the other one, um, Hobby Lobby. And you can buy bags of uh, just pieces of material. They sell them for $5 a bag. And it's amazing what you can do with those. <laughs> All kinds of costumes have come out of those bags. <laughs> very so, nice. Very anyway, nice. a little creativity and uh, taking them places. We went to um, Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge in southwestern Oklahoma uh, over Memorial Day weekend. Had to take the chickens, you know, just had to. <laughs> 
posing with a cactus. With the cactus, with the wildflowers, yeah, yeah. Tarantula, there's a tarantula picture. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. And there's just a lot of my friends just think it's hysterical. So I, I shall keep on. <laughs> Please do. So uh, last question for me, and always the most important question is, what is your favorite bird and why? Oh my God, that's a hard question. You know, I kind of have like a favorite in each family. Um, I'll try to break it down. <laughs> I, I, I have, oh, I love red-headed woodpeckers, but um, I have two. First one is snowy owl. Um, I saw my, my wild snowy owl in Oklahoma. Of all things, I grew up in New England and never saw a snowy owl, and they're there every winter. They come, they would sit on top of the Capitol building in Concord in New Hampshire, and I was clueless. I didn't know about birds back then. So we drove five hours and saw a snowy owl in a field out in north central Oklahoma. And when I saw that bird, it did something to me. Uh, it was like a spiritual experience. I don't know what it was. And... Uh, I mean, we could, you could see the feathers on its feet and just beautiful, beautiful bird. And so that was my first favorite. I was fortunate enough to, I have a friend in um, Kansas, Pete Jansen, um, who knew where some black rails were. And he took me to see black rail in Kansas. And that kind of turned into another favorite because just so rare to see. We actually saw two that day. And I will be forever grateful to him for helping me get black rails. But anyway, those two, that, nice. a white bird yeah. and a black bird, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> black rails, a species I have yet to see. Yeah, but, well, good, good luck with that. Yeah, right. You know where I saw my first one in a picture? It was being eaten by a great blue heron in California. Oh, I, I'm familiar with that situation, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, it's like really, Come on. <laughs> but now I've seen them in real life and it's very cool. Very, very cool. good. Very yeah. good. Well, Sandy Berger, thank you so much for sharing your time and your stories with all of us. I really it was fun. hate it. It was fun. Thanks everyone for tuning in today and tune in again on Saturday at five o'clock when yours truly will be the interviewee with Leslie Peacock being the interviewer. So I hope to see you then. Be good and good birding to everybody. Have a good summer. Bye, Sandy.